Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, this is the uh, conference committee on House File 1555 uh, on the uh, Senate, or I'm sorry, on the Transportation Finance and Policy uh, Conference Committee. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody today. The um, order that we're going to uh, do it, uh, to begin with is we'll go through the side-by-side -side comparisons after which there is some uh, testimony involving the uh, issues revolving around uh, transit. Uh, I would anticipate that we would be done with the side-by-side -side, uh, right around 3 o'clock. We will proceed with testimony on transit until 3.30 and then we will adjourn. Uh, with that, Ms. Stengel or Mr. Burgess, who goes first? Mr. Burgess. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, so we'll be walking through the side-by-side -side language. First, to orient you, there is a summary document that should be in your folders or packets, and then there's side-by-side -side language of the, both the House and Senate language. That's what this document looks like. It's titled uh, Transportation Omnibus at the top. And on the left side, you'll find the House language. Senate language is on the right side. Uh, because it's a House file, that puts the uh, House language on the left side, and it will follow the order of the original House bill. Uh, the Senate language is uh, largely in the same, following the same order, but uh, there are some uh, sections and pieces that are moved to align with um, comparable provisions or provisions between House and Senate. So there will be a couple of spots where uh, the Senate language is, is out of uh, order from its original. So moving into the to the side by side um, walk through, uh, Article One is appropriations for both House and Senate, and that was uh, largely covered through the spreadsheet walkthrough. So we'll be starting in on um, discussing more detail on R20 page R27 of the side by side, and this is a House only article, Article Two on transportation uh, bonding. This authorizes a total of two, um, two billion dollars uh, in trunk highway bonds, and that is uh, spread between state road construction at 1.7 billion. And that's over, spread out over eight years, and then uh, 300 million for the corridors of commerce program. That's spread over three years. So the language in in that article contains the the bond authorization as well as those appropriations um, and appropriations for bond sale expenses. And then moving to page R29, uh, Article 3 contains a variety of transportation related uh, taxes and fees. Uh, Section 1 is a house only provision that modifies the registration tax and makes some changes regarding the, the rates, uh, the fees imposed, uh, what is included in the calculation of the tax and the depreciation schedule. Uh, and then article, or sorry, um, section two on page R31 now. Uh, the language on the House side modifies the allocation of revenue from a surcharge on all electric vehicles so that half of the revenue continues going into the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund and the other half would go into a new account that's being established elsewhere in the bill that uh, provides for electric vehicle infrastructure. And this lines up with a, a change on the Senate side, but that's actually a, a, a distinct um, provision. So the, the Senate language establishes a, um, or increases a fee for all electric vehicles. Uh, the next section is a Senate only section. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and members, the next section is on R31. It's a Senate only section. It establishes a surcharge of $100 per year for plug in hybrid electric vehicles. And then, Mr. Chair and members, we'll be uh, just to orient you jumping back and forth on House. Yeah, and just that for the purpose of the record, uh, Mr. Burris and, and Ms. Stengel will be jumping back and forth. So, uh, those who may be listening to the record in the future, that's who is speaking at this point. Mr. Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Section three is the first of a couple of sections that establish a or reestablish a technology surcharge. Uh, this had been in place in the past and um, sunsetted, and the House proposal would be to, to reinstate the surcharge. This goes on uh, motor vehicle registrations as well as uh, some titling transactions and transactions involving driver's licenses and identification cards. 
in the House language would set a uh, surcharge fee at a higher amount for two years at 475 and then dropping down to, to $2 per transaction in the future. Um, and then section four is a house only provision as well. It would increase a filing fee on motor vehicle transactions uh, for both um, uh, renewals and other types of transactions involving uh, motor vehicles such as uh, titling and, and carrier motor carrier fuel licenses. Section five is a, another piece of the technology surcharge. I would also note um, that that technology surcharge all goes into an account that would fund the driver and vehicle information system. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair over here, could, Senator Hall. Uh, could we have the page number added when, when you say a section, because I'm having a hard time following you. Thank you. Yes, um, Mr. Chair, sure. So uh, I'm on page R33, and you'll see the page numbering, by the way, at the, at the bottom of the, the document, and the R's are kind of used as an indicator that this is the page numbering with respect to the revisor side-by-side -side document, as opposed to the page numbers that are shown in the uh, left and right um, columns reflecting pages and lines of the original House and uh, Senate language. So on R33, section five, is a uh, another piece of the technology surcharge that's house only and then on page r34 uh, section six has a couple of pieces to it uh, the the first is to increase fees for driver's licenses both uh, real id compliant and non-compliant licenses and it's a across the board uh, fee increase for for all of the classes of licenses this section also includes another piece of the technology surcharge increase or, or uh, reimposition. And then on page R37, I'm sorry, R36, section seven, this is another house only provision that uh, again addresses filing fees. This would increase filing fees on uh, driver's license and identification card transactions. So there's a, a filing fee on the, on the motor vehicle side and a filing fee on the driver's license side. And then on page R37, uh, another house only section. This goes along with section nine. So this is sections eight and nine, uh, increase the uh, motor fuels tax. And this uh, has a, a phase in of four increments, increasing the tax uh, by a, a total of 20 cents per gallon um, that would be the rate that it's increased by for gasoline and diesel fuel. And then there's a corresponding rate increase to other types of special fuel that's proportional, more or less based on energy content of, the, of, the, of that fuel. And then the house pro proposal also includes uh, indexing of the motor fuels tax. And that would start in 2023. On page R38, there's a Senate only provision. It's Senate section 92, and this is the tax on use of electric vehicle charging stations. And essentially what this does is impose a tax on electricity uh, metered out through a charging station for electric vehicles um, at any location other than a residential location. Uh, and then moving to page R40, uh, section 10 is a house only provision. This would modify the allocation of revenue coming from motor vehicle leases, or known as a motor vehicle lease sales tax. And the, uh, the reallocation includes uh, a, a portion going to the general fund at a flat 32 million, and then a modification to the formula for distributing the remaining funds. Um, and that includes uh, an increase in the portion that would go to metro area roads uh, by pulling in um, both Hennepin and Ramsey County. And the, the, the calculation for distributing that aid is, um, uses a uh, portion of the uh, county populations. And it also eliminates local bridge funding through this uh, revenue stream and create, it modifies uh, the formula as well to include small city assistance as uh, uh, receiving ongoing aid. And then starting on uh, page R41, 
uh, House Section 11 modifies uh, revenue allocations from a couple of state sales taxes. So that there are three uh, state sales tax revenue streams that would be changed to go to the general fund instead of to uh, roads and bridges through the highway user tax distribution fund. Uh, those are the, the state general sales tax on auto parts or attributable to auto parts, uh, the state general sales tax as it applies to rental vehicles and the rental motor vehicle tax. Uh, and then page R44, section 12 is a conforming change. The substantive language is on page R45. This is section 13. This is also a house only provision that would establish a, a new transportation sales tax in the Twin Cities metropolitan area. Uh, among its elements, the sales tax would be um, imp imposed by the Met Council or the, the legislation would direct the, the, the council to impose the tax. Uh, the rate would be at uh, one half of 1%. And the distribution would be 50% uh, going to the Met Council for transit purposes and 50% going to the Transportation Advisory Board. And the language also establishes minimums for how the Transportation Advisory Board would allocate that uh, portion of the revenue. Um, you can, and you can see the minimums um, on page R46. So there's a, a portion for highways, transit, active transportation, and then a, a flexible amount. This provision also authorizes revenue bonding on the part of the uh, Metropolitan Council against the, this tax revenue stream. On page R47, section 14 is a change to the motor vehicle sales tax. It would increase the rate from 6.5 to 6.875 of the motor vehicle sales tax. Uh, section 15 modifies the revenue allocation formula for motor vehicle sales tax. And that would reduce the amount going into the highway user tax distribution fund and increase the uh, amounts going towards transit, both the metropolitan area and uh, greater Minnesota transit uh, formulas or, or percentages are adjusted in that. On page R48, uh, Article 4 is, is a house only uh, article that uh, has a couple of provisions relating to transportation, climate, and the environment. Uh, section 1 modifies uh, the goals of the Department of Transportation to identify um, zero emission vehicles as well as um, uh, uh, accomplishment of, of transportation goals with minimal impact to human health. Uh, section two establishes a legislative report for MnDOT um, on uh, climate action and, and achievement of, of um, greenhouse gas reduction emission goals. Uh, section three goes along with the, the goals around um, low, low emission and efficient use of transportation resources. And then um, also on page R49, section four establishes the electric vehicle infrastructure account. And this is the, the account that uh, is funded by uh, the reallocation of the electric vehicle surcharge that was mentioned earlier. And uh, the funds um, under this uh, account are provided to the Department of Transportation to uh, arrange for electric vehicle supply infrastructure throughout the state. Um, and then Article 5 is also a house only provision. And this starts on page R50. And I'm, what, was, what I would uh, highlight are a couple of things of the entirety of, of this article. Um, this has to do with driver's licenses and uh, eligibility to receive a driver's license and some uh, related practices around that. Um, the first piece of this is that it uh, eliminates uh, required proof of status, uh, lawful status, lawful presence in the United States in order to obtain a non-compliant driver's license. Um, it, the uh, house language also identifies some additional primary as well as secondary documents that can be used in order to obtain a non-compliant license. So things like a, a foreign passport or a consular ID card, and 
it lists out a number of documents. And this follows uh, the sort of layers on top of the, the current structure that's in place in administrative rule for uh, providing documents to prove identity, uh, date of birth, and, um, and uh, uh, residency in, in, in Minnesota. The language on also establishes a, a card marking of for not for voting if in some scenarios where citizenship has not been uh, demonstrated. And it uh, has some data practices limitations on um, sharing data outside of the department that is specifically related to status um, or citizen lawful presence or not having demonstrated lawful presence or citizenship. Uh, the language also includes uh, restrictions on law enforcement actions that are solely based on uh, a card that's marked uh, under, under this language. And there's a repeal of uh, rulemaking or a limitation on rulemaking that's, that's in place under current law. So that runs from pages R50 through R60. So moving to Article uh, 6 on the House side, Article 2 on the Senate side, this is the, the remainder of the bulk of, uh, of finance and, and policy pr provisions. And the, the first of those is then uh, Senate only. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, on page R60 on the Senate side, there are uh, three Senate only sections. Section 1 on R60 and Section 2 on R61 both direct the legislative auditor um, to audit the programs and services administered by MnDOT and by DPS. Senate Section 3 on page R61 appropriates money in the data security account um, to the legislative auditor for purposes of auditing some of the data programs that DPS has. And then, Mr. Chair and members, um, sections on R61, sections 1 and 2 on the House side, um, go along with a couple of other sections that are uh, elsewhere in, in the bill um, and align with uh, sections four and five on the Senate side. So we'll, we'll be returning back to this. The, the essence of this is to allow for data sharing between the Metropolitan Council and uh, Department of Human Services um, for on uh, coordination of um, the Metro Mobility Program and, and potential receipt of additional federal funds. Um, so there's uh, House and Senate differences on both uh, uh, policy matters as well as the technical approach in um, creating that authority to share data. Uh, and then on R62, uh, Section 3 on the House side and Section 6 on the Senate side is, is one of uh, several <coughs> uh, provisions related to uh, registration process and motor vehicle dealers. Uh, this uh, section is the has the is substantively identical between House and Senate, with a difference on effective date, and uh, establishes a restriction on uh, manufacturer uh, char chargebacks or withholding of payments under some circumstances. Page R67, uh, Section Four on the House side is a. A definition change that goes along with some bicycle regulation uh, changes that will be covered a little bit later <coughs> in the side-by-side um, -side walkthrough. On page R67, Mr. Chair and members, you'll see Senate Section 7, and this is the first of a series of provisions that prohibit the commissioner from using any trunk highway funds on bicycle routes and bicycle lanes. Um, and the same change is made throughout statute to be consistent. Uh, so. For future sections, um, when I talk about trunk highway funds on bike lanes, that's what I'm talking about. And then, Mr. Chair and members, on page R68, the House side, section 5, and there's, a, there's another section a little bit later, uh, also deals with uh, bicycles. Uh, this uh, directs the commissioner of the Department of Transportation to provide technical assistance to local units of government relating to the bikeway type planning. Uh, and then um, also on R68, there's a provision that both the House and Senate carries with policy differences. Uh, this is Section 6 on the House side and Section 8 on the Senate side. Um, and this regards uh, establishment of bikeways and uh, limitations or placing priority on preserving disability parking. 
Um, the policy difference here regards uh, that the, um, well, I guess the way I put it is the, the House is, is established, the House language establishes that local units of government need to place a high priority on protection of disability parking, uh, whereas the Senate language creates a stronger prohibition on establishment of, of the um, bike way if it would result in, in elimination of disability parking. There's also a difference in effective date between House and Senate. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, on page R69, um, I'll take sections 9 and 10 together, even though that's a little bit out of order, and both of these have to do with prohibiting trunk highway funds on bike lanes. And also on R69, Mr. Chair and members, uh, section 7 is a conforming change for something that will come later. Uh, section 8 goes along with the uh, bikeway planning. Uh, this would establish or, or identify a Jim Overstar bikeway that would uh, run from the Twin Cities north to kind of along uh, Lake Superior to Canada. Mr. Chair and members, starting at the very bottom of page R69, you'll see Senate section 11. And this is, begins a series of sections on uh, min pass lanes and changing the number of people from two to three uh, for the threshold of when you can use the min pass lanes for free. Um, section 12 on R70 amends how the revenue is handled from the min pass lanes. It sort of reorders um, and reprioritizes how that funding is spent. And it also repeals a separate subdivision. Uh, you'll see in the repealer later that treats the I-35 min pass lane a little bit differently. So under this provision, all min pass revenue is treated the same. Section 13 on R70 and section 14 on R71 are conforming changes. Section 15 on R71 <coughs> provides the definition of a low occupancy vehicle that I mentioned earlier. Senate section 16 on page R71 is another prohibition on, of trunk highway funds for bike lanes. Uh, section 17 on R71 requires um, DPS and MnDOT to submit a report every odd-numbered year that talks about their expenditures and transfers from both the Trunk Highway Fund and the HUTDF. And then, Mr. Chair, members, page R71, the very bottom, section 9, uh, with the, the language actually continuing on the, on the next page, uh, that's actually a conforming change that goes along with a trunk highway turn back that's being authorized in the House language later in the bill. And then on page R72, uh, there's a, a series of um, memorial highways and bridges being authorized. Uh, both House and Senate have uh, several of the same provisions with technical differences. Uh, House language uh, has a, a different, and, and Senate have different, uh, slightly different names for one of the uh, memorials, and um, uh, there are some other, uh, well, as I said, technical differences between the various memorial highways and bridges. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, going past all of the designations, we'll take you to page R74 on the Senate side. Um, there are a series of provisions starting with section 28 on R74. And this amends the municipal approval of uh, road projects. And taken together, these four sections will allow any city to appeal to an appeal board, uh, the detour route for proposed project, and the, the timing of the project. And the timing appeal is if the city believes there is more than two years of remaining service life on the road, uh, they appeal to the appeal board. If the appeal board determines that there is more than two years of remaining life on that road, MnDOT is responsible for paying all of the costs, including the local shares for that project. Um, and that will cover sections 29 on R74 and sections 30 and 31 on R75 are part of that. And then, Mr. Chair and members, on page R75, House only section 17 would uh, authorize uh, MnDOT to create a employment preference, Indian employment preference for some um, construction projects that are near a reservation. And then on R76, uh, sections 18 and 19 deal with utility relocation. They would authorize MnDOT to, to uh, incorporate in utility relocation into contracts, uh, as well as limit trunk highway fund expenditures 
on uh, utility relocation costs for uh, some utilities installed uh, um, after uh, an August 1, 2019 date. On page R76, section 32, adds pickup trucks to the definition of farm truck. And a pickup truck is something, uh, one of the pickups with a nominal carrying capacity of three-quarter ton or less. Section 33 on, uh, sorry, Senate, section 33 on page R77 and House section 20 are very similar. This allows a dealer to determine the base value of a vehicle in certain situations. If you flip to page R78, you'll see that there is a difference on the Senate side, the Senate pulls in a cross-reference to subdivision 1N, and that's a reference um, to the uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle surcharge, and then the effective date is different between the two provisions. And then, Mr. Chair and members, on R78, uh, Section 21 is a house-only provision that uh, addresses weight limit uh, <coughs> violations, variances for uh, some scenarios involving transportation of unfinished forest products. Um, and then um, moving to page R81, uh, section 22 on, in the House language, section 36 in the Senate language uh, provides for withholding, dealers to withhold registration tax payment. And that is uh, identical language except for an effective date difference. Um, section 23 on the House side, and this is also on page R81, uh, section 37 um, on the uh, Senate side is one of a couple of sections that authorize decommissioned military vehicles to be registered and operated on public roads. That language is identical between House and Senate. And then moving to page R82, uh, section 24 is Senate-only language, and it's the first of a couple of sections authorizing new special plates or plate designs. Uh, section 24 regards multinational peacekeepers in Beirut, Beirut Lebanon, um, and then uh, Section 25 is a special plate for Minnesota agriculture. That's on page R84. Page R85, House Section 26 is Alliance Clubs International special plate. And then on page R86, House Section 27 is a Rotary International special plate. Um, and then that, Mr. Chair, brings us to page R87 and a um, the Senate only provision. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. On page R87, section 38 amends how the proceeds of the Law Enforcement Memorial Association uh, special plates are handled. Um, this will require the commissioner to annually distribute the amount of the funds in the account to the Law Enforcement Memorial Association for to further the purposes of that organization. Uh, the next section, House Section 28, Senate Section 39, uh, is a similar provision with the exception of the effective date, and this allows uh, dealers, uh, auto dealers, to move vehicles in between lots without having to retitle the vehicles. House Section 29 and Senate Section 40 at the bottom of R87 going on to R88 requires the commissioner to commissioner of DPS to uh, designate a dealer entitled liaison person. Uh, to help the dealers. And again, identical except for the effective date. Section, uh, House Section 30 and Senate Section 41, still on page R88, uh, says that the certain late fee doesn't apply to transfers, uh, from, transfers from licensed vehicle dealers, and this is an identical provision. <coughs> section, House Section 31, Senate Section 42, has to do with the EBTR system, and it will allow other companies that can transmit data to use this system. Uh, there's an effective date difference there. The House has July 1st, 2020, or upon completion of the necessary program, whichever is earlier, and the Senate is August 1st. And then, Mr. Chair and members, uh, page R88, uh, House only, section 32, identifies uh, types of data that licensed dealers are able to obtain which are um, as specified under a, uh, a federal data, data, essentially data law for uh, sharing motor vehicle and driver's license information. Um, and then page R89, House Section 33, Senate Section uh, 43 is a, another piece of the de decommissioned motor vehicle, uh, military vehicle. This is on authorizing uh, titling of the vehicles. House, and that's identical between uh, House and Senate. 
And then house only um, provision is in section 34, which would authorize use of a consular identification card as part of uh, the uh, process for vehicle titling or registration. Uh, another house only provision is uh, section 35, and this would uh, establish that uh, duplicate titles issued by deputy registrars would be treated as an expedited service, and the fee imposed would be um, at an amount that uh, deputy registrars typically uh, retain uh, for expedited services. Um, and then section uh, 36 on the House side, Section 44, Senate side, uh, is a uh, provision on uh, motor vehicle titling and secured uh, parties. And this is identical between House and Senate, except with, reflect, reflect, with respect to the effective date. And just as a, as a, a, a reminder, um, when effective dates aren't being identified specifically in the, in the language, uh, because there are appropriations in the bill, the effective date defaults to July 1st. And so where, where in, the, in these various House provisions that are uh, blank on, on effective date, it's July 1. And that compares with a number of these to August 1 on the Senate language. Um, also on page R90, section 37 on the House side, uh, section 45 on the, on the Senate side is a, a provision on uh, dealer... Uh, notifications on uh, secured parties and providing that to the department. Um, the bottom of R90, Section 38, uh, House language, and Section 46, Senate language, uh, establish a Driver and Vehicle Services Executive Steering Committee, and there's a number of differences between House and Senate. Uh, the House language includes uh, establishing or identifying various uh, purposes there are differences in membership <coughs> between House and Senate. Um, there are some technical differences. Um, and then as there are uh, some specification of duties and reporting that differ between the two. And finally, the, the House and Senate um, have uh, a different expiration date that's established. Uh, so that brings us to page R93, uh, section 39. Uh, House language and Section 47 uh, Senate language is the first uh, is a definition of a term uh, that is part of uh, authorizing automated driving. So we'll get into the detail behind that uh, in a uh, subsequent section. Uh, section 40 is another um, definitional change that's part of bicycle regulation modifications, uh, along with uh, Section 41, and those two are. Uh, house only provisions. Uh, section 42 on R, it's still on uh, page R93. Section 42, uh, along with section 43 on the House side, sections 48 and 49 on the on Senate side, uh, again relate to definitions for automated vehicles. There are differences between uh, House and Senate um, on some of the automated vehicle regulation. You see the beginning of that in the highly automated vehicle definition. Um, so there, there are a number of policy differences. One of the highlights here is on whether a uh, operator has to be physically present in the vehicle or not. Uh, moving to page R94, uh, this also relates to automated vehicles. Uh, this is House sections 44 and 45, Senate sections 50 and 51. These are also uh, definitions of terms. On page R94, section 52, you will see a definition of motorized foot scooter, and the diameter of the wheel is increased there. Um, and the effect of that is it will pull in additional uh, motorized foot scooters that will be subject to the state law. And then our, on R94, uh, house section 46 is a, another uh, term definition that relates to bicycle regulations uh, changes that are later in the bill. Section 47 on the House language, Section 53 on the Senate language. Uh, these are definitions of the terms, uh, again, the first of a series of definitions and uh, uh, substantive language that go together. And this overall provides for authority for testing, or I'm sorry, for 
uh, platooning, motor vehicle uh, platooning. And this part is uh, identical between House and Senate. Moving to page R95, section 48, House language, section 54, Senate language is uh, definitions. And this is one piece of changes to move over law requirements when uh, certain vehicles are uh, on the side of the road. And this was, uh, or similar language was uh, enacted actually just recently this session. Uh, section 49 is a house only provision that modifies a residential roadway definition, expanding it to include um, other types of, uh, or other uh, segments of road. This would have the effect of allowing uh, local units of government to set 25 mile per hour speed limits in uh, areas that are zoned for housing but aren't classified as collector or arterial streets. Um, still on page R95, section 50 on the House side, section 55 on the Senate side is another uh, definition that goes along with the motor vehicle move over law uh, requirements. And then section uh, 51 on the House side, 56 on the Senate side is a, another term definition for vehicle platooning. And then we're back to automated vehicles. Um, and this is section 52 in the House language and section 57 in the Senate language. Uh, the uh, technical approach is different. The, arguably the, the, the essence of the policy goal is, is uh, similar between House and Senate on this. And it uh, establishes um, that, uh, that uh, well, it concerns um, the rights and duties or, or power traffic law requirements for uh, operators that are involved with autonomous vehicles. At the um, bottom of page R95, section 53 in the House language and section 58 in the Senate language uh, modify requirements for um, stopping for work zone flaggers and uh, particularly in allowing for uh, peace officers to issue citations under some circumstances when a, um, operator, a motor vehicle operator hadn't uh, um, followed the um, directions of a flagger. And there are a couple of uh, clarifying provisions that are different between the House and Senate language. Mr. Chair and members, on page R96, there section, Senate section 59 is the Senate only provision. Uh, this allows a person to go five miles an hour over the speed limit on a multi-lane road um, when passing another vehicle. Section 60 allows cities, uh, sorry, section 60 on page R97 allows cities to establish speed limits other than those in the uh, state law on city streets. On page 98, Senate section 61 uh, has provisions about people not driving in the furthest left-hand lane unless one of the exception applies. And if you are driving in that lane and you're passing somebody, you need to move back into the right-hand lane as quickly as possible. And then, Mr. Chair, members, on page R99, uh, the House section 54 is one of the bicycle regulations changes. Yeah. Uh, this has some modernization of language uh, as well as uh, modifying the requirements around passing a bicyclist. This would have the effect of aligning with a change that was made uh, a couple of years ago regarding uh, the, uh, on uh, spacing. Um, um, uh, distance when passing a, a bicyclist. Mr. Chair and members, on page R99, Senate section 62 is Senate only. And this is one of two provisions in the bill that have to do with large vehicles like semis and how they handle roundabouts. Uh, this section allows large vehicles to deviate from their lanes uh, when going through a roundabout. House section 55 and Senate section 63 on page R100 are a platooning provision um, that exempt vehicles in a platoon from the following distance law. Also on page R100, House Section 56, Senate Section 64. Uh, this is the um, passing authorized vehicle provision that Mr. Burris mentioned earlier. And essentially it groups together two sub, um, a current subdivision and an additional subdivision that's later repealed. 
uh, together and calls them all authorized vehicles and requires people to move over or slow down when they're passing one of these vehicles that's stopped on the side of the road with their lights on. Uh, you'll see that there are a few uh, different differences um, in paragraph F on page R101 and the effective date. On page R101 at the bottom, House Section 57 and Senate Section 65 has to do with school buses. Um, when a school bus, it allows a school bus uh, that's traveling in the right-hand lane uh, to pick students up to re-enter the lane of traffic without actually having to turn right. Section 66 on the Senate side on page R102 is the other provision about semis and roundabouts, and this governs um, when there are two of them next to each other, which one of them has to um, yield the right-of-way. And then, Mr. Chairman, members, on uh, page R102, section 58 is uh, another piece of the bicycle regi uh, uh, regulation changes. And this clarifies that uh, the operator of a, of a bicycle on a, on a shoulder has, the, has to follow traffic uh, rules in the same way as if uh, operating in a, in a lane of a road. Uh, it also includes a technical change that uh, centralizes the rights and duties language. So the, that paragraph B is being added in this uh, subdivision and removed from uh, the following, uh, uh, a language in the following section, which is uh, section 59. Uh, so that section 59 it's, is also on page R102, and that's a, another piece of the bicycle regulation changes and uh, modifies some of the, the bicycle riding rules. Um, and then uh, moving to page R103, uh, section 60 on the House side and section 67 on the Senate side. Uh, this is the first of a series of sections regarding uh, on-track equipment that operates on rails and uh, changing the, the motorist stopping requirements to uh, treat the on-track equipment in the same manner as trains. Uh, so that extends to um, House sections uh, 61, 62, and 63, as well as Senate sections 68, 69, and 70. And that language is identical between House and Senate. Um, and then moving then to page R106, section 64 on the House side and section 71 on the uh, Senate language uh, relate to school bus operation and would allow school buses to to re-enter, uh, uh, go through an intersection from a right-hand turn lane uh, without having to turn right um, when, uh, when it's part of uh, loading or unloading children. That is identical language between House and Senate. On page R107, uh, section 65 in the House language, section 72 Senate language uh, modifies the colors for part of uh, uh, a school bus to allow for ad additional coloring. Section 66 in the House language and Section 73 Senate language uh, allows for company signs to be mounted in transportation network company vehicles. So this would be Uber, Lyft, for instance, um, and it would allow for uh, illuminated signs. That is identical language between House and Senate. Uh, section 67 on House and Senate Section 74 uh, modifies standards for um, uh, warning lamps that solid waste vehicles use and add in recycling vehicles to, to utilize those standards as well. Uh, the language is the same between House and Senate except with respect to the effective date. Uh, and then at the very bottom of page R107, uh, House Section 68, seven, Senate Section 75 uh, relate to window tinting and have some uh, technical changes and also um, an authorization, uh, the substantive piece is to authorize um, a, additional drivers uh, of a vehicle that's been tent tinted and um, the House and Senate uh, have a difference in, in regards to uh, who the ex expanded authorization applies to. So House, it, in both House and Senate um, identify a number of folks, and the House also 
pulls in um, grandchildren and personal care attendants. Uh, page R110, House Section 70, uh, allows for towing two trailers or two semi-trailers under some circumstances um, involving uh, inventory of property being transported from a manufacturer or dealer. On page R10, Mr. Chair and members, Section 77 on the Senate side is the first of two sections that modifies seasonal and load restrictions uh, for sewage septic tank trucks um, if they're hauling on their routes. Uh, the next section that starts on the bottom of page R110 and carries over onto page R111, uh, the first subdivision is similar in that um, the restriction is removed on line 6612 of the Senate. So a vehicle with this special three unit vehicle permit um, and some of the other permits in that same section can be traveling anywhere on Trunk Highway 53. And I'll let Mr. Burris handle the rest of that section. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and members, and then the, the House language has a couple of other uh, modifications to it. The first is to specify the types of commodities that can be uh, transported under both the three unit and two unit special permits to identify paper products and iron ore tailings. Uh, and then second, the House language, and you'll see this on page R112, uh, retains the current routing that's permitted under a, a special tire hauling permit. That's a separate permit, but is codified in the, in the same section. Um, and then moving to uh, the bottom of page R112, there's a series of sections um, that have similar language but with a policy difference between House and Senate. And this concerns a, um, another special permit for uh, transporting agricultural products. Um, this is section 72, 73, and 74 on the House side. And uh, sections 79, 80, and uh, 81 on the Senate side. Uh, both House and Senate create a definition for what constitutes the agricultural products that can be transported. Uh, the Senate language includes um, some uh, additional commodities. Uh, there are also technical differences in uh, structure uh, between House and Senate. Uh, the next section, uh, section 82 on page R114 is the other, the companion for the um, sewage septic hauling tru uh, trucks and it makes some of those exemptions I mentioned earlier. The next section, um, House Section 75, Senate Section 83 on the very bottom of page R114 that carries on has to do with vehicle platoons um, and at a very high level it allows the commissioner to approve plans for vehicles uh, to up to three vehicles to operate in a platoon system. Um, the required information is largely the same. There are a few differences on the process, on how it works, and how things are approved or not approved. Um, uh, and I, I think I'll just leave it at that, and we can talk in detail if you have questions. And then, uh, Mr. Chair and members, on page R116, uh, House Section 76 is the first of a series of sections that uh, overall have the effect of limiting this the uh, scenarios or, or situations where somebody's driver's license can be suspended. So that uh, the result of, that, of the series of changes is that uh, DPS would not be able to suspend a driver's license um, for failure to appear in court, uh, resuspend for a violation of driving after a suspension or revocation, uh, or suspend for failure to pay traffic tickets. Uh, the language also includes a driver's license reinstatement provision or retroactive type uh, reinstatement and some <coughs> requirements on data collection and uh, legislative reporting. So there's a series of sections that will come up uh, interspersed later in the side-by-side -side language. And then also on, at the bottom of page R116, uh, section 77 <coughs> and 78 uh, create definitions of terms for uh, an authorization of third-party testing program that'll, the substantive language comes up a little bit later. Uh, section 79 on page R17 <coughs> is a conforming change, and that, that goes along with a uh, driver's license modification that's uh, house only. That'll come up in a minute here. Uh, section 118, uh, House 
section, or I'm sorry, page R118, <coughs> House section 80, uh, allows for uh, placement of, a, of an identifier on a driver's license or identification card uh, reg regarding autism or mental health. Section uh, 81 allows for emergency contacts <coughs> to be identified as part of a person's driving record. And that's also a, a house only provision. Section, uh, page 119, sections 82 and 83 are part of the driver's license uh, suspension provisions that I discussed. Um, then also on R119, um, section 84 is another driver's license uh, suspension prohibition change. Moving to page R120, House section 85, Senate section 86, contains the, the substantive language on authorizing third party testing for school bus operators. Um, and then house only provision is in section 86. This is also on page R120. It's another piece of the driver's license suspension provisions. And this is the uh, reporting requirements. Um, and then page R122, uh, house only section 87, uh, directs MnDOT to create a statewide uh, prioritization project process for uh, development and identification of transportation projects. And it, it lays out some of the um, factors in the prioritization and requires assignment of weighting, uh, as well as uh, requiring um, solicitation of input from various stakeholders. Another house only provision is in section 88. This is also on page R122. And this directs MnDOT to maintain an inventory of transportation related assets. On page 122, Mr. Chair and members, Senate section 87 requires the Commissioner of Transportation to develop a pavement investment guide uh, and requires the local district offices to sort of prioritize their roads and select pavement in accordance with that policy. Um, and then at the bottom, Mr. Chair and members, at the bottom of page R122, uh, House Section 89 would uh, uh, broaden eligibility for public Greater Minnesota Transit, uh, public transit assistance to include tribal governments. And then on page R123, uh, this makes House Section 90 <coughs> has uh, some modifications to an advisory committee on non motorized transportation. Uh, it would rename it to be a Committee on Active Transportation. Uh, the House language would uh, also specify some um, additional duties uh, or recommendations to be covered by the committee um, and uh, extend the expiration of the committee, which is currently, um, uh, it, it currently has an expiration date of June 30, 2018. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, on page R-123, Senate Section 88 amends that same section of statute, but uh, to a different purpose. This is one of the provisions that prohibits use of trunk highway funds on bike lanes. Um, and moving to page R-124. Uh, the Act of uh, Senate Section 89, the Act of Transportation Account, uh, under this section, the money in that account is appropriated to the commissioner for the stated purposes. Section 90 on page, uh, Senate Section 90 on page R124 and House Section 91 is where we get into the substantive provisions for automated vehicle testing. Um, and I'll just highlight a couple of the, the major, major changes here or the major differences. The House um, will allow vehicles to be tested without a uh, driver present in the vehicle and the Senate requires a person in the vehicle that is able to take over um, at any point in time for the driving. Uh, the Senate also requires um, what's commonly referred to as gated testing. So you have to test first in a closed facility, then on a minimal traffic geofenced area, and then you can test on public roads. Um, there are uh, in both uh, ways the similar process. You apply for a permit to test um, some of the requirements and the process for applying for that permit um, are different. The House has some provisions about notification and working with local governments and tribal governments when uh, and railroads, depending on where the testing route will occur. 
the Senate has a um, misdemeanor penalty uh, for driving without one of these permits. The House doesn't have a stated penalty, so that would default to a petty misdemeanor. And then finally, there are some changes to, or some differences on what data should be collected, who should talk to each other about the data and the reporting. Um, and then on page R128, House section 92 uh, modifies the uh, criteria for when uh, a uh, conditional appropriation would be available to, to MnDOT for snow and ice control expenses. On page R129, Senate Section 91 <clears throat> prohibits the use of trunk highway funds on bike lanes. And then on page R129 as well, uh, House Sections 93, 94, and 95 uh, relate to uh, MnDOT's Rail Safety Inspection Program. And there are a series of changes in, involving the program. Uh, a couple of highlights. One is that uh, additional positions are authorized under the program. Uh, the the uh, duties of the state rail inspectors are broadened. Um, there are some requirements of established for MnDOT around what uh, what the agency needs to do in implementing the program, um, and then some uh, clarifications and broadening of of the uh, assessment that's placed on uh, the railroad companies to cover the costs of the program. Um, section 96 on page R131 is a house only provision, and this. Uh, broadens the uses of funds from a grade costing safety account to include uh, uh, program delivery costs. Uh, house section 92 is uh, also a house only provision. This establishes a uh, minimum uh, crew complement of two for class one and class two railroads in some circumstances. Um, and then at the uh, bottom of page 98 on R131, with the language extending or continuing into the next page. Uh, this is a house only provision that allows for um, a, or establishes a, an exception to interstate transportation hours of service involving transport of uh, utility construction materials. Um, on R132, house only provisions sections 109 through 103. Uh, create a, a, a an update to various regulations around wheelchair securement and transporting individuals who are in a wheelchair, and it uh, modifies the um, the standards and specifications and identifies responsibilities of of drivers. Um, and then that brings us then to page R one thirty four. Uh, House Section 104 modifies the allocation of some citation revenue, fine revenue, uh, so that an increased portion would go into the Minnesota Grade Crossing Safety Account. So it's an increase from one million, kind of a phase in, and two steps to end up at uh, 2.5 million of a, a, a portion of revenue that's provided under some circumstances. Mr. Chair, members, on page R134, Senate Section 93 requires the Commissioner of Public Safety to do an annual report on the Vehicle Crimes Unit, um, focusing on the revenue generated by that program. And then on R135, Section 105, uh, this House only language requires or limits, uh, narrows the requirements around uh, an electric infrastructure, electric vehicle infrastructure charging stations, uh, so that those requirements on um, bi-directional charging and safety standards would only apply to infrastructure that's been installed by the state. <clears throat> On page R135, Mr. Chair and members, Senate Section 94 is the beginning of several sections on airport zoning, and I'll tee that up now so we can sort of skip over the rest of the sections later. Um, these provisions apply to uh, local governments near airports, and it amends the process by which you adopt your airport zoning plan. There are some default provisions that you can use from the commissioner, or you can adopt your own customized plan, and it provides um, how that works and how it integrates with your other zoning. And then on page R135, uh, there's a number of sections regarding uh, regulation of unmanned aircraft. Uh, sections 106 and 107 concern, the, uh, concern a couple of definitions of the, of the aircraft. 
Uh, Mr. Chair and members, on the bottom of R135, Senate Section 95, and going on to the next page, Senate Section 96, are the airport, more of the airport zoning provisions. Section 97 on page R137 is the air transportation service charge. Um, and here, the Commissioner of Transportation um, is required to charge air users for certain things. And uh, one of the differences here is whether the, the House allows the Commissioner to charge users for a portion of aircraft acquisition, replacement, and leasing. And the Senate requires that charge to be implemented. And then two funds are established to um, accept these um, charges and specifies what they are used for. Um, and then on page R137, uh, House Section 109, again, relates to unmanned aircraft and uh, provides for notification and review by MnDOT when there are local ordinances involving uh, unmanned aircraft. Mr. Chair, members, on the bottom of uh, page R137, we have several pages of airport zoning provisions. Um, and I gave the high level on that earlier, so I'll just, in light of time, we'll go ahead and skip over uh, to page R147. And page R147 on the Senate, or sorry, House side, uh, section 110 is another unmanned aircraft provision. This uh, modifies what, uh, what the registration and registration taxing uh, requirements would be for some unmanned aircraft so that in some circumstances, the, the, the craft would be registered at $25 instead of the, the current registration tax for aircraft. And in other circumstances, um, there, there would uh, not be a fee. Um, and then Section 111 also relates to unmanned aircraft. And this uh, concerns the um, uh, insurance requirements for the, for, for the aircraft. And then on page R148, Section 112, uh, concerns tax refunds for uh, unmanned aircraft systems that are uh, removed from the state, not, not receiving a refund. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, on page R149, we'll pick up with some more airport zoning sections, uh, and we'll skip over those, and that gets us to page 152. Senate sections 117 and 118 on that page define light rail transit and streetcar. The next provision, House Section 113 and Senate Section 119, um, as well as the following sections. Uh, excuse me, let me back up a minute. Uh, House Section 113 and Senate Section 119 on page R152, going on to page R153, um, expand metro mobility. The House expands metro mobility to Lakeville, and the Senate expands uh, metro mobility to Lakeville, Columbus, Forest Lake, Maple Plain, and Ramsey. The next sections, House Section 114 and Senate Section 4 on page R153, uh, are a similar approach with different coding to how data and what kind of data can be shared between um, Met Council and DHS. And you'll see that actual language on page R157. And that carries on to page R158. Um, a difference here is the effective date. Uh, Senate is immediately effective. This House has a little bit of a delay and has an application clause um, and some provisions relating uh, to the notice requirements the House has in their provisions. Section House Section 115 and Senate Section 120 on page R158 make permanent a, an allocation of RAM vest. Uh, the regional allocation of motor vehicle sales tax to the um, urban tr uh, opt-out transit providers. And then on page R159, uh, Mr. Chair and members, House Section 116 provides uh, authorization to the Metropolitan Council for uh, additional bonding. Uh, and then uh, House Section 116 uh, narrows a limitation um, on uh, use of Met Council bonds for light rail transit. On page R160, House Section 118 uh, directs the Metropolitan Council to uh, coordinate and, and implement bus deployment and routing uh, based on uh, the uh, air quality identified through uh, modeling and air quality monitoring data. On page R160, Senate Section 121, um, prohibits state, state funds for being used for light rail um, lines or extensions 
uh, beginning with south, uh, Southwest is covered by current law, but anything after that. Uh, and there is a definition of operating costs. On page R161, Senate section 122, state money is, uh, cannot be used for capital cost of a light rail project. And on page R161, uh, House section 119 uh, broadens a liability limits provision for co-located freight rail and light rail. This would have the effect of uh, including the Botnell light rail transit line in that uh, in those liability limits uh, provisions. Section 120 in the House and Senate Section 141 uh, regard a, a expansion of a, a U of M Met Council initiative on uh, zone passes, and uh, there are some policy differences between House and Senate. Uh, both have the effect of uh, expanding the number of stops by at least one. Um, it's just some differences in coding of the requiring or establishing the program as well as in uh, how the funding would work. Uh, House Section 121 is an, a data collection provision that relates to the driver's license suspension provisions. And then also at the bottom of page R161, House Section 122 uh, modifies a um, rest area in Floodwood so that uh, the city would not need to um, operate and uh, maintain that property. Uh, moving to page R164, uh, House only sections 123 and 124 extend a uh, pilot program in two harbors for community destination signs. On page R. On page R120, uh, sorry, on page 164, Senate Section 123 um, extends the moratorium on ditch mowing permit enforcement until April 30th, 2020. Section 124 is another uh, provision related to the dedicated fund expenditure report that we talked about earlier, and this requires an interim report before the first report is due in 2021. On page R165, Senate Section 125, there are some administrative provisions relating to the DVS Executive Steering Committee and how they should get started. Senate Sections 126 and 127 allow the City of Burnsville and the City of Minneapolis to prohibit engine braking or jake braking on um, specified highways in each of their respective cities. On R166, Senate Section 129, there is some signage um, and funding uh, sorry, signage for a rail crossing in Anoka and the request of the commissioner to uh, make it a priority to find funding to fix that crossing. Section 133 is a public awareness campaign for the keep right driving provisions we talked about earlier. Section 134 um, requires the commissioner of MMB to reduce uh, appropriations to MnDOT and DPS um, in the amount of unfilled FTE positions over a certain period. Section 135 requires MnDOT to do an RF uh, request for information for a private entity to operate MnPass. Uh, uh, moving to page 167, <laughs> House Section 125, Senate Section 137 um, allows the Commissioner of DPS in consultation, um, allows the Commissioner to issue uh, temporary motor vehicle permits for up to 180 days. The Senate language requires the Commissioner to consult Sorry, this was the commissioner of MnDOT, not DPS. Uh, requires MnDOT to consult with DPS, and the House language requires approval of DPS. Section 132 is some transition language uh, for the prescription window glazing that we talked about earlier. I mean, then, Mr. Chair, members on page R168, uh, section 127 on the House side. This is the another piece of the driver's license suspension. This is the reinstatement language. Uh, and then also on R-168, House Section 128 provides for a conveyance of MnDOT property that's currently part of State Rail Bank. Um, and then moving to R-169, House Section 129 provides for a uh, turn back of a, a, a route that runs through South St. Paul. Also on 169, R-169, House Section 130 and Senate Section 130 uh, provides for uh, facilitated meetings between the Met Council and Calhoun Isles Condominium Association. Uh, this language is identical between House and Senate except for the effective date. On R-170, uh, House-only Section 131 
directs the uh, city of Minneapolis to provide rail safety meetings during the construction of the Southwest light rail transit line. Uh, House section 132 and Senate section 128 require establishment of signage to uh, identify uh, the location of the Minnesota State Academy for Deaf and Minnesota State Academy for the Blind and uh, sets uh, prohibitions on sign removal. Uh, there's a technical difference as well as a, um, a requirement, uh, different, a difference on uh, funding between House and Senate. Also on page R170, House section 133 establishes a mileage-based user fee pilot program, uh, sets out the, the objectives of the program, provides for uh, authority to, uh, in, for MnDOT to administer, uh, lays out data requirements and sets up a, a legislative report. Page R172 is the next uh, provision. This is a House only provision on uh, section 134 and this would require a uh, study uh, that's performed or contracted by the Commissioner of Public Safety to look into the impact of uh, traffic laws and whether there's been a dispor disproportionate impact based on geographic area, demographic groups, it lays out various uh, requirements around the study. And then on page R173, there's a legislative report required of MnDOT. This is a house only provision found in section 135 and would direct MnDOT to look at uh, legislative reporting in consultation with a variety of uh, stakeholders that are identified in the language and uh, take a look at informational gaps as well as uh, uh, similar information that's provided in, in other formats and uh, uh, provide that information back to the legislature. Um, and then on page R174, section 136 contains a, revisor's, a couple of revisor's instructions uh, for technical uh, <coughs> modifications of, uh, of language on provisions that have been discussed earlier. Mr. Chair, members, on page R174, you will see Senate Section 138, and that transfers jurisdiction of the Stone Arch Bridge um, from the Commissioner of Transportation to the City of Minneapolis by July 1st. On the bottom of R174, Senate Section 39 sets up a vehicle registration task force, uh, and this task force will study different methods for vehicle registration uh, over the interim and report back to the legislature next year. On page R176, uh, there is a requirement that a vibration susceptibility study be conducted on the Calhoun Isles property in Minneapolis. On page R177, House, Senate, House Section 137 and Senate Section 142 provide various repealers relating to pre provisions um, that we've talked about earlier. I will note, uh, at least on the Senate side, paragraph E uh, repeals the expiration of the Mississippi River Parkway Commission, and there's no corresponding policy language. Um, before that, and I think Mr. Burroughs might have something to add to that. Yeah, Mr. Chair and, and members, there are a couple of, uh, of repealers that don't go along with, with prior language on the House side. So this is Section 137, uh, House language. Paragraph B uh, repeals a required Office of the Legislative Auditor review of Met Council transportation uh, financials. And Paragraph C repeals a limitation on uh, planning, study, and, uh, design and construction of commuter rail in the Dab Patch Corridor. And finally, Mr. Chair, on page 177, Senate Section 143, there are effective dates and application provisions that apply to all the airport zoning provisions we talked about earlier. Thank you, Mr. Stengel. Thank you, Mr. Burris. Uh, we are going to move now into uh, taking testimony. I note that we're running a little bit uh, late but we're going to do the best that we can. Uh, Chair Slawick and uh, Mr. Shetnan, if you would care to come forward, please. Welcome, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Newman, Mr. Chair Holmes. Mr. Shetnan, uh, whoever wishes to go first, uh, just for the record, state your name and position and uh, proceed with your testimony, please. Chair Newman, Chair Hornstein, and conference committee members. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to share a few remarks today as a chair of the Met Council. I'm Nora Slawick, the chair of the Met Council. What I'm going to do is prevent, present remarks, and uh, Judge Shechton, our uh, director of government affairs, is here for questions. Uh, so we'll proceed that way. 
Uh, first of all, a diversified and sustainable transportation funding package is critical for the metropolitan area as we plan for the growth of our region. By the time a child who's born today reaches, graduates from college, there will be about 700,000 more people in our metropolitan area. That's like moving the entire population of North Dakota into the metropolitan region. Just think about what that would do to our growth of our roads and of our infrastructure. We need to take a bold approach that invests in transit, roads, and bridges. <clears throat> Governor Walz's plan is bold and transformational. He believes we should aim high, and I agree. The governor has recommended a plan that will do several important things. First, it will build 10 new bus rapid transit lines over the next 10 years. This means investing in projects like the D, B, and E bus rapid, bus rapid transit lines. These lines will see limited stops and more frequent service. Fully implemented, these bus rapid transit lines will connect 500,000 more people to a 30 minute commute to work or school and an increased ridership on our busiest corridors by 40%. The A line, which maybe you uh, have been on, goes from Rosedale and Roseville down Snelling and then over to South Minneapolis, is the region's first arterial bus rapid transit line, and it's been an undisputable success story. The governor plans on that success and will create a multimodal network of transitways throughout the region. This means mobility and accessibility for all of us and our 700,000 new neighbors. The governor's plan will, invest in technology and transit amenities, including 220 all-electric buses. These investments will increase the speed and reliability of local routes. It also means improved shelters, fare collection, fare enforcement, as well as an improved administrative presence on the system. The governor's plan will also eliminate the structural deficit in bus and separate metro mobility from rail and bus budgets. This means the regular route bus system will see investment instead of being involuntarily harvested to fund federal and state mandated ADA services for Metro Mobility riders. Let me be clear, both of these services are critical to our region and both should be funded just now out of the same pool of dollars. Funding the base is essentially a step backward. We can't add Metro Mobility service without negatively impacting other transit service. In fact, we can't even preserve and maintain our current system with just base funding. Let me explain. As you have heard in our testimony to your respective bodies, the service demand for Metro Mobility has been aggressive with no sign of slowing down any time soon as our population ages. This means that under the current funding program, Metro Mobility is placing tremendous pressure on our bus system. In this biennium, there is so much growth pressure that it is shifting other transit service that has been funded with the general fund onto the metro area transit share of the motor vehicle sales tax. Those MVEST revenues fund metropolitan area bus, which is the metro transit and suburban transit providers, and we're forecasting a nearly $200 million deficit to just preserve and maintain our regular route bus system within the next 10 years. That means there already isn't enough revenue to go around. To make matters worse, in the 22-23 biennium, Metro Mobility, Metro Mobility will need MVEST assistance as well because it will just have consumed the entire general fund base. That just makes the structural deficit for regular route bus service that much worse. You know, as a former uh, seven-term legislator, as a former finance chair, you know, I know that all of you have a choice. I believe we need to move beyond one-time money. I believe we need to move beyond preserving and maintaining, and I believe we need to have a vision and we need a plan to fund it. I appreciate the other voices that are weighing in on transit investment, and even the Minnesota Chamber has said more work needs to be done to address the long-term funding challenges facing the metro area bus transit system. Base funding does not address those challenges. I look forward to working with all of you uh, to resolve our differences and pass a bill that has a vision that keeps our region economically competitive and prosperous. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Shepman. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to uh, speak here. I'm actually um, going to defer to you and, and answer any questions that uh, the committee may have. 
Well, I appreciate that, Mr. Shetton, uh, very much. I think what we are going to do, however, is we're going to move through our other testimony or testifiers okay. uh, simply because uh, we're running out of time. But thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Shetton. We have six okay. testifiers thank in the uh, we're on the agenda to testify. First would be uh, Mr. Daniel. Ryan Daniel and if Mr. Luther Winder would uh, both come to the testifying table at this point and I'll just kind of shuffle you through. Welcome Mr. Daniel. Uh, Thank you. If you would state your name for the record with whom you are uh, associated and proceed with your testimony and for the current testifiers and those that are coming up uh, uh, please understand that uh, we were hoping to get you up here at 3 o'clock, and, and so just try to be respectful of the time. Mr. Daniel. <coughs> Ryan Daniel, CEO, St. Cloud Metrobus. Chair and committee members, thank you for taking the opportunity to hear me today. I have handouts for you. Uh, if we could have uh, Paige hand them out, thank you very much. <coughs> I am testifying today on behalf of the Minnesota Public Transit Association, known as MIPTA. MIPTA advocates for high quality service that is accessible and available to people in communities, large and small, urban, suburban, and rural to achieve a statewide balanced system of multimodal transportation. Today, I will speak to the needs in greater Minnesota. With employment growth, in regional centers and Asian populations, Minnesotans are asking for longer hours of service so they can use transit in the evenings and on weekends and as well as expanded service areas. The amount of service that Minnesota transit systems can provide is closely tied to the amount of funding provided by the state. In 2017, state funding covered approximately 65% of the transit system operating costs. Our large urban systems, Duluth, Rochester, St. Cloud, Moorhead, have the same pressures to meet ADA requirements as the Twin City metropolitan area. Our rural systems are in the midst of developing local five-year plans to provide a more complete picture than the state plan alone can provide. Each five-year plan establishes a vision and details on service improvements, allowing transit systems to develop better year-to-year -year budgets and assist our communities in planning ahead for their required local share of investment. In addition, this process will help systems better deliver service and work towards overall goals such as improved coordination of services and increased ridership usage across the network. Systems across the state have a need for new buses, technology upgrades, staffing shortages, and facilities. Therefore, MIPTA strongly supports the house investment for Greater Minnesota. For context, the projections to meet 90% of the public transit needs by 2025 as outlined in the 2017 Greater Minnesota Transit Investment Plan requires an average annual of $22.8 million. Bus service is affordable, flexible, and cost effective. When people have access to transit, they are able to stay employed and remain independent members of their communities, saving the state millions in health and human services expenses. Where transportation goes, the community grows. MIPTA has always supported a multimodal transportation funding package and continues to do so. Buses need safe, well-maintained streets and bridges, as well as bicycles and pedestrians. Thank you for taking the time to hear from me today to talk about the need for increased investment. Thank you, Mr. Daniel. Uh, if uh, we have next uh, Patsy Murphy, if she would uh, make her way down to the testifying table, I'd recognize that. Mr. Winder, please proceed with your testimony. All right, Mr. Chair, committee members, I'm Luther Winder, I also have a handout as well. I'm representing the Suburban Transit Association and I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Valley Transit Authority which is one of the four transit agencies within the Suburban Transit Association. The other three agencies are Maple Grove, Plymouth, Metrolink, Plymouth Metrolink, and Southwest Transit. We provide service to the following cities, which I think is important to note, Apple Valley, Burnsville, 
Chanhassen, Chaska, Egan, Eden Prairie, Maple Grove, Plymouth, Prior Lake, Savage, Rosemont, and Shakopee. Our almost six million trips a year connect people to the urban core and the suburbs for work, entertainment, and daily life activities, and are a part of the fabric that has helped this region to grow and thrive. We'd like to share some of our concerns with the current proposals. We are concerned that the bills as currently drafted, as currently drafted, do not provide adequate statutory dedicated funding to allow the suburban transit association providers to invest and modernize in the regional transit system. The STA estimates an investment of 17 million to modernize and expand to meet the residents, to meet the needs of the residents we serve within the region. Some of our agencies have substantial needs to modernize and repair garages at it to meet ADA requirements as well as a state and state of repair, as well as needs to repair some of our many parking decks. In addition, investment and sustainable funding is needed for new service concepts like the Maple Grove Route 784, which is hourly service between Starlight Transit Center in Brooklyn Park to Maple Grove Transit Center. It will provide a critical link for employment opportunities for residents within the region as well as services like the Southwest service in the Southwest service area, the new Prime MD service. That would be an extension of the current successful and cost-effective Prime service, which is similar to delivery to a, similar, to a delivery of a shared ride Uber type, Lyft type service now that provide emergency medical, non-emergency medical trips. That service will provide a critical links for transit-dependent riders that are elderly, as well as transit dependent to medical appointments. Other services like some of our existing services, like continuing the existing Route 495 provided by MVTA. That serves Mall of America, Burnsville Transit Station, Marshall Road Transit Station, Amazon and Mystic Lake in Scott County. The suburb to suburb route is now MVTA's fastest growing route and accounts for over 4% of our total ridership. The service has higher average weekend ridership than weekday which shows that individuals are now traversing in suburbs, obviously on non-traditional work shifts that need to get to work, get to appointment on the weekends. It's important to note that existing funding constraints prevent three of the four suburban providers from providing late night and the vast late night service and the vast majority of our communities receive no weekend service at all. Also, there's new other concepts like the new MVTA comps providing a circular service connecting the affordable housing in Scott and Dakota County. What we've seen is an increase in affordable housing that's moved out in the suburbs with no transit link. We want to connect them to better, to connect them to transit centers for better access to employment and daily life activities, something that many of those sites have not, don't have now. STA recognizes the critical need for more transit funding, but equality and budgetary certainty are critical concerns for STA members. We are thankful for the support we've received from legislators from both parties for the need, for the understanding for the need for a strong and robust bus system, but that system should include suburban providers. In closing, and we talked about the 700,000 new people, that's actually part of mine. In closing, the Thrive MSP 2040 Transportation Policy Plan expects the population of suburban um, transit provider service area to increase by an average of 36% by 2040, compared to 29% growth in the region overall. So a lot of those individuals will be traversing and be living in the suburban communities. We need sustainable funding that's statutorily dedicated, just like the core, to maintain our services and to meet the demand that we're going to see for the future as well. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Winder. Uh, is Patsy Murphy in the audience? Uh, if you would please uh, approach the uh, testifying table. And uh, also Mr. Michael Lopez, uh, if he is in the Audience, please come to the testifying table. Uh, Ms. Murphy, uh, identify yourself, please, for the, well, uh, for the record. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, and tell us with whom you are associated and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Patsy Murphy. I live in Bloomington Townhome that I co-own with my best friend. Um, when I was 26, I experienced a traumatic brain injury, a TBI, that left me in a coma for four days. Now, that was in 1991. Today, I still suffer from the long-term effects of my TBI. I have short-term memory problems, communication difficulties, including aphasia, and I find it difficult to stay organized and 
on track with tasks. All of these make using public transportation and driving dangerous for me. Even though I may look normal, I cannot navigate a bus route or get to where I need to safely. Fortunately, Minnesota provides accessible transportation in the form of Metro Mobility. This service lets me get out into the community and supports my independence. I can get to where I need to be without relying on friends or family to drive me. I have been using Metro Mobility for the past 20 years, and I'm here to tell you it's not a perfect system. We don't have time for all of the ins and the outs, but I want to give you an example. I come to the Capitol every Tuesday with the Minnesota Brain Injury Alliance and use Metro Mobility to get here. Getting here for a three hour event takes me from 6.30 in the morning until 5 p.m. Now remember, that's over 10 hours just to be here for three hours. Please support funding for improvements to the transit, especially for programs like Metro Mobility, which are a lifeline to people like me. Finally, I'd like to ask you to support my friend Mitchell. His idea to include emergency contact information on the driver's licenses is included in the house language. If this had been in place at the time of my injury, my loved ones would have been notified far sooner and been able to help advocate for me while I was in a coma. Thank you for all your work to improve transportation in Minnesota. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Uh, if Mr. Grilly would come to the testifying table, uh, next on the list to testify is uh, Mr. Lopez. If you would identify yourself, please, and proceed. Uh, yes. Uh, hello and good day. My name is Michael Lopez. I'm a resident entrepreneur and business owner here in St. Paul. <clears throat> 840 Selby is my new address for my business and residence. I have been in transportation uh, for most of my life, uh, starting at the age of 13. Uh, today I have a patented product for transportation equipment aid to alleviate the ergonomic stresses of lifting, reaching, pulling, pushing, and carrying while unloading trucks. I also have a commercial driver school called Commercial Driver Training Employment Company, which is new to Minnesota. Um, Registrar's office and also fulfilling a great need in the greatest deficit that we've seen for commercial drivers in American history With the amount of 250,000 bodies missing from trucks is why the automation of truck driving is being discussed And before we give away all these opportunities and jobs <clears throat> To machines I'd like to have an opportunity to provide it to working hard-working people especially for the state of Minnesota seeing a great deficit not just for drivers, but for unemployment uh, our business model will support local businesses as well and help increase the opportunities for public transportation. Uh, for all the stories that have come before me today, our business model is very straightforward. We want to enhance our community and the, in the community in which we live and provide our services. At this juncture, I'd like to also um, speak specifically about the uh, light rail. <clears throat> um, I've seen a lot of different dangers just in the, on university alone. Uh, one of the things I want to mention uh, today is that enhanced safety uh, is something I've noticed, especially as a commercial driver, instructor, and school owner. Safety is integral and the only thing I really teach on. <clears throat> I would like to also um, offer a couple of ideas um, to the body here today um, that might generate revenue for the state and the cities between Minneapolis and St. Paul. By Minnesota being one of the feature places for bike rides and and scenic views, <clears throat> I am extensively encouraging that we invest <clears throat> more into that infrastructure so that folks like me and my business <clears throat> interests, when they come in town, have an opportunity to see more than just the Twin Cities area and have the opportunity to see Greater Minnesota on the bike. This is one of the key attractions that the folks that I'm working in business with uh, were really appreciated about our state and our city. I'd also like to speak to the lack of skilled drivers on the road. <clears throat> which increases the danger for everyone else, especially those who rely on Metro Mobility and other similar services. Um, I would want to encourage um, a little bit more scrutiny at the commercial driving testing centers. 
Um, but at the same time, I also realized that the current scrutiny is creating a dramatic line, uh, wait line for opportunity for economic development, which is holding back a lot of people at the lower end of the financial spectrum from acquiring and having jobs on a regular basis. I know and feel sincerely about the transportation industry from an aspect of business, but not only that, but for the, for the void that fills, we have perfectly well-bodied and able people that all we have to do is train. I'd also like to encourage in this conversation healthy eating. As a commercial driver trainer, healthy eating is integral for your safety outside of ours. One of our commercial trucks can take out at least 10 people on the road with one accident. 90% <clears throat> of all accidents happen because of driver fatigue. The driver fatigue is, is pushed by uh, bad eating habits, <clears throat> lack of proper diet, and lack of knowledge. All of this has to do with transportation very specifically because as you decide what vehicles can haul doubles and triples is what the technical term is for two or more trailers. As you pass legislation to haul certain vehicles with certain types of freight on certain roads, it is very integral that the person behind that wheel is qualified and able to do that work. I can't stress enough how many accidents happen because of an untrained driver or a lack <clears throat> of, of energy from fatigue uh, by the driver. And I'll end with this. <clears throat> I would also um, want, to, want to reiterate the growth of the transportation industry. What I see for Minnesota initially for transportation as the light rail came in was a great big debacle in your offices because of the legislation and leadership years ago passed up the opportunity to install the rail lines, which created a little bit of a hassle for you. So I'm encouraging today that you look to the future of transportation in general. And not just for yourselves, but the populace who is taxpaying base. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Uh, uh, the final testifier I'd ask to come forward would be Mr. Uh, Will Schreier. Um, and have a seat. I will recognize Mr. Grilly. Welcome to the committee. Uh, identify yourself and proceed with your testimony, please. Mr. Chair, members, uh, my name is Dorian Grilly. I'm the executive director of the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. The Bicycle Alliance has worked with communities, educators, and business leaders all over Minnesota that want to make biking and walking more convenient and safer. The 60-member Minnesota Mayoral Active Transportation Caucus has two simple messages for you. Bicycling and walking is important, as important, in small towns, regional centers, and the suburbs as it is in the urban core. And the other message is that bicycling and walking should be part of any transportation funding bill that you guys pass. The Bicycle Alliance has trained over 750 educators to teach an elementary school safety curriculum called Walk Bike Fun. Those teachers are now reaching 70,000 kids a year. So there is demand that's growing for biking and walking. There are 25 nationally ranked bicycle friendly communities and nearly 90 bicycle friendly businesses and believe it or not, the most are in Fergus Falls, Minnesota, not Minneapolis. So on behalf of these community and business leaders and educators and many others, we ask you to please include the funding for biking and walking that is included in both the House and the Senate bills. If combined, they will help with the needs in greater Minnesota and the metro area. This includes a one-time transfer of five million of federal funds into the uh, active transportation or transportation alternatives program and the portion of the house bills metro sales tax that is dedicated to biking and walking. We also ask it th that you support the one-time increase of 500,000 for safe routes to school and 122,000 for the active transportation grant program that's in the house bill. Um, we also support the policy provisions that we worked with Senator Jasinski and Representative Bernardi on, and we respectfully do not support um, the provision that would restrict MnDOT from spending trunk highway funds on bicycle lanes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Grilly. Uh, Mr. Schroer. Thank you, uh, Chair Newman and members of the committee. My name is Will Schroer. I'm the Executive Director of East Metro Strong. We are a partnership between Washington County, Ramsey County, six East Metro cities, 
Health East 3M and the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce and it's more than 1,000 members, most of which are uh, employers in this part of the uh, state. Thank you for this opportunity and for your hard work to ensure that Minnesotans can get to both work and opportunity. Yesterday, Ecolab, one of Minnesota's leaders in business, hosted a conversation about the new bus rapid transit planned to serve their world headquarters. I'd like to share with you a couple of the things that their CEO, Doug Baker, had to say to us yesterday afternoon. Transit is hugely important. Efficient and reliable public transit helps companies attract and retain employees. Bus rapid transit in particular is a very smart investment. And overall, the three to one return on investment in transit makes a lot of sense. Uh, you can read more of Mr. Baker's remarks in the Star Tribune this uh, morning. Uh, Mr. Baker was referring to work uh, when he mentioned the three to one return on transit investment that we just completed with the Minneapolis Regional Chamber. Supported by the Itasca project, we examined the return on investment in transit that we will make in building out the regional transit system and connecting more people to jobs uh, in this region. We found that three to one uh, return on investment and interestingly and importantly, the numbers show that most of those benefits would actually go to people using the road system. That includes truckers from greater Minnesota coming to or passing through the Twin Cities. They would see more reliable traffic speeds and lower shipping costs because fewer commuters are on the roads in front of them. We released that study on April 25th and I have given a copy to the committee administrators. I urge you to read it and would be delighted to answer any questions you had about it. Committee members, there is a strong business case for funding transit across Minnesota. The report, the ROI report also details a number of the uh, benefits of uh, transit investment to businesses in greater Minnesota, getting folks to work at plants there and generating employment opportunities across Minnesota. We urge you to respond to this business case and fund uh, the transit needs that you've heard about here today across Minnesota. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Scharr. Uh, members, uh, Chair Hornstein and I have uh, vis visited very briefly. We are going to uh, go until about four o'clock and I will tell you that I do have another appointment I'm almost late for. Uh, but we do have Mr. or I'm sorry, Representative Tapke, you do have a question or you're on the list. If And if you don't, uh, feel free to withdraw. Oh, I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Representative Tapke. Thank you. It was uh, a question um, back when uh, Chair Slawick and uh, Mr. Shetnan were on. Uh, yeah, Mr. Shannon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Shetton, I just had a question about transit. As uh, as we talk about transit and the transit investment, um, the governor's uh, the governor's plan for the metro wide sales tax has an eighth of a cent sales tax for um, transit, and then our house uh, bill has a half cent for transit with half of that going to um, Met Council and half that going to the Transit uh, Transportation Advisory Board. Could you talk a little bit about what the differences would be uh, between those two plans and what would happen between an eight cent, well, between zero and an eight cent or eight cent and a half um, as to what people could expect to see from that type of investment? Mr. Shep. Uh, great. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, Judd Shetnan, I'm the Government Affairs Director for the Met Council. Uh, Chair Slavik had to leave. We have a council meeting at 4 o'clock today, so she uh, she ran out to do that. But uh, to Representative Tabke's uh, uh, point, the way that the governor's bill works, he has a $1.5 billion plan that uh, that is predicated on the uh, one eighth uh, cent sales tax. It also invests over 200 million dollars in, in uh, general obligation bonding. We receive the adjustment from the um, 6.5 to 6.875 percent of, uh, of MVEST, which is uh, common to both transit and to, uh, to MnDOT and how they receive that. And then we also uh, make the movement from Metro Mobility uh, from the, uh, we separate Metro Mobility from the, um, from the light rail and bus operations. So that's how we get to that number. There are some differences in between how the governor and the uh, House uh, move forward with how things will be funded in them. I'm going to make sure that uh, I know that that uh, Andy Lee is paying attention as well. But the what the Senate or excuse me what the House does uh, is different than how the governor proposes 
light rail funding uh, moves forward. I believe that the House bill has the part of the sales tax that comes to, uh, to the Met Council, Metro Transit, pays for uh, what was previously the state's share of, uh, of, uh, of the LRT operations in the governor's bill uh, that stays with the state. And so that 50% share, we would be coming back asking for that, um, uh, for that additional uh, funding. But the governor's plan, I'm just going to restate, does a, a number of things. We prepare uh, or we're prepared to invest in, in 10 new transit ways, uh, highway BRT, arterial BRT throughout the region. Uh, we invest in additional uh, service, uh, regular out bus service. We also have uh, an investment in electric bus. Uh, and so we believe that there is some major investment that we're able to move forward with, uh, with the investment in transit through that sales tax and those other funding sources that are carried along, which is also some of those are common to the, to the uh, House bill. What the House bill would allow uh, to the, the, uh, the council to do would be to do additional service, addition expansion in, uh, in regular out bus. It would probably mean that we would be in a position to do uh, some additional uh, transit way investment as well. And so what that does is it would uh, accelerate or maybe not even, it would accelerate uh, the additional transit uh, regular out bus service that we would have and potentially allow for the acceleration of doing maybe two or three additional uh, of, the, of the busways uh, at the same time where we're stacking them uh, one on top of the other. It's just important to uh, state that, um, you know, we, we both agree that this investment is, is really important and uh, we just take a little bit different approach to it. But the, the, uh, the House bill also, and I can't speak to what the Transportation Advisory Board would do, but the way the House bill uh, it breaks that out is you allow them to go ahead and disperse uh, uh, that sales tax 30% to transit. I believe 30% goes to uh, an investment in roads and roads. Uh, and then you have a 30% or 10% I believe goes to bikes and then 10 or the other 30% is flexible. And so I can't speak to what they would do, but that 30% of that of their quarter cent would mean uh, that would, that's the part that I'm talking about would accelerate that because the house bill provides uh, a quarter cent directly to the council where we're at an eighth of a cent. And that's where, uh, when I talk about, um, uh, they, they interact a little differently with how light rail is being funded and those. It's just really hard to completely explain what, what it would do because I, I, uh, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but that's kind of breaking it down to the best of my ability. But the additional increment, the quarter cent that goes to TAB uh, is, is something that the TAB would have to decide, but that is, is new investment beyond what we would be able to do with the governor's plan. Thank you, Mr. Shetman. Uh, Representative Cagle, uh, we ha also have uh, Senator Jasinski and Representative Kornstein wishes to ask a question. So members, please watch the clock. I, I really do want to be done by about four. Uh, thank, you, Ms. thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to kind of elaborate on what um, Mr. Shetton was saying about what this actually means to people in our communities. Um, I represent Anoka County, which has often kind of been ignored by um, some about with uh, ignored when it comes to transit and roads. We have Highway 65, um, which has as many commuters on it as Interstate 35. But imagine driving on Interstate 35 with a stoplight every half mile or so. Um, and so, and I've also heard from a lot of our constituents too that uh, so to get from Coon Rapids to Blaine, you have to go down to um, Minneapolis. So when I hear the proposals that uh, Mr. Shetton is, is talking about, I see the rapid BRT going from Minneapolis up to um, Northtown running along Central Avenue, which would really alleviate a lot of that traffic on Highway 65. Um, I also see instead of having to take two hours to get from Coon Rapids to Blaine, um, we have um, our families being able to go, you know, on a 15 minute bus ride versus a two hour bus ride. Um, and so I just, I really do want to emphasize how important this is to the people in our community when it comes to not spending so much time in their cars um, and being able to spend more time with their families. Um, you know, I, I just, I really 
think it um, it's really about the people in our communities and making sure that they um, have a you know more time to spend at home. Thank, Thank you. you, Representative Cagle. Uh, Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Shetton. Uh, and I'm sorry, I apologize. I've been going back and forth to E12 in here. Uh, so some discussion of uh, 200 new electric buses uh, being proposed. What's the difference in the cost between an electric bus and a standard bus about approximately? Um, Mr. Chair. Chair and members, we had this discussion in the House uh, over at North uh, High School in Minneapolis. I think it was in March, may have been February. But uh, there is a... A cost increase over a standard 40-foot bus costs about um, uh, four, 400 to $500,000. The cost of an all-electric bus is, is closer to 900 to uh, $1 million. However, there is uh, an offset as far as the energy consumption that would come along. And the committee, I know I go back quite a while at the, at the council, and we had this conversation about hybrid buses back in... 2001, 2002, 2003, and as the industry brings this new technology forward, the overall cost of those uh, vehicles will drop over time. And so since we are kind of on the leading edge of that right now, those costs are, uh, you know, probably about double what a regular uh, bus that we would purchase today is. So, Mr. Chair, just to follow up, so wouldn't it make us more sense uh, to wait until that cost uh, starts coming down than get it at the high end starting up front? Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Jasinski, uh, we are looking to invest in all of them, uh, you know, after we are able to, um, to, to put together a funding package. They would be uh, brought in as we retire our fleet, as uh, another provision in this bill includes our regional transit capital bonds, which allows us to... Um, uh, replace our fleet based on the federal schedule and those dollars will um, and so we replaced about 10 percent of our fleet every year and so we would be uh, making that transition as we uh, go through the process of, of of replacing our fleet and and as folks know this is a 10-year plan and it's a 10-year vision and and we think that that is absolutely the right way to go we think that that what we're able to do as far as um, the environment and uh, areas that we talked about in North Minneapolis that have high areas of asthma and pollution um, are uh, obviously a place that we want to make sure that we are able to run our service without impacting the, the community and the environment. Mr. Hornstein, uh, I think you've got a question or a comment, I'm not sure, then sure. perhaps you could, uh, when you're done, just give us some ideas to uh, uh, your plans maybe for tomorrow as we sure. uh, transfer the gavel. Thank uh, you. Chairman Hornstein. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair. And this is a question for Mr. Schroer. I don't know if he's still here. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Schroer, I really appreciate this report. And I think it's excellent. Um, my question is what you outlined, I think, a lot of the benefits, the, the cost benefit. Uh, analysis of uh, and return on investment with transit. Um, have you in your conversations with the business community or work in the business community um, give us a sense of what are the costs of inaction if, if we just have a status quo transit budget uh, and, uh, and, and don't make the kinds of investments that, that you and the other business leaders have been advocating for? What, what, would, what would the region look like in 10, 20, 30 years if we don't make these investments. Mr. Schroer. Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Horn, uh, Representative Hornstein. Uh, off the top of my head, I'd list three that we tend to hear most about. Uh, the first is in the region, uh, we're seeing businesses move around so that they can uh, be on transit. Uh, the uh, uh, president of the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce and I wrote a piece in the Pioneer Press a couple of years ago about <laughs> businesses that were moving from the East Metro to Minneapolis uh, because we didn't have suitable uh, transit access for their employees in the East Metro. Uh, that's not healthy for the region. Uh, we're not losing those jobs in the region or in Minnesota overall, but it's not healthy for the region. We're losing regional balance. Uh, we're also losing uh, uh, talent to, um, to regions that outside the region that have much better transit than we do. Uh, we lose a lot of folks. We used to be the, the destination for talent kind of off the prairie, if you will. Uh, most of that talent now goes to Denver. Uh, 
And they are very explicit, both the folks going there and the business leaders in Denver saying, we built our transit system so that we would be that destination. We are now that destination. Uh, and they are, they are taking literally our talent away from us. Uh, and then I guess uh, the third thing that we mostly hear is uh, the inability to kind of move around within the region. And that's for the people in the region and it's for the freight that comes to and through the region. So uh, I, I and you both mentioned in the report the, uh, the cost of inaction include the inability for product, whether it's uh, windows from a war road or it's agricultural products from all over the state. Those are coming to the cities, both for con consumption here and then for further distribution or they're on their way to Chicago. Uh, the costs of delay in those in, in, uh, for those folks are enormous. And that's where you see a lot of the, the benefits from remo removing those costs. Uh, and then there's just the inability to move around the region. Now we've demonstrated that when you invest in transit, uh, there can be plenty of congestion on 94, but you can still take the green line to the loons game, right? Uh, and it doesn't necessarily always fix the congestion on 94, but there's always a, a choice and we can build uh, and absorb those 700,000 people that are coming without, without locking people into congested highways. We can offer people the opportunity to move around and uh, to not do that. Uh, the, the, I'll, I'll say one last thing because I know you're eager to both let the chair get to her meeting and, and to move on as well. Um, we looked back at a similar study that the Minneapolis Chamber and the Itasca Project did in 2012, also called the Return on Investment Study. Uh, that study projected six billion in uh, in net returns for the region, building out a, a transit system. We haven't built most of those lines yet. We're missing out on those benefits. That's a real cost in avoided uh, benefits to everybody in this region and therefore in the state that we're just missing out on. That's the cost of inaction. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Schroer. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you. Uh, and uh, just to conclude, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have posted our next meeting for 3 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, that is, of course, somewhat contingent on timely completion of the Regents' uh, uh, session that we have uh, tomorrow, uh, the Joint Assembly between the House and the Senate. Uh, the agenda for tomorrow, uh, Mr. Chair and members, would be that we uh, uh, go over the same and similar provisions in the bills, uh, adopt the same ones if we can, and. Uh, uh, we'd like to work with staff to see how we can make the similars the same uh, and maybe do some uh, uh, work on that as well. So um, I am uh, potentially interested tomorrow. We haven't really uh, um, talked about this yet uh, with uh, the department, but um, we do have one other uh, entity that this uh, committee funds uh, in addition to uh, transit and roads and bridges. We also have the Department of Public Safety, and I think I'd be interested in maybe having some brief comments from the chairman uh, or the commissioner there uh, about uh, their, their thoughts on, on the bill. So we may have some, we may have, if the schedule allows, we may have the, the commissioner come, but uh, we'll focus tomorrow a lot on same and similar. All right. Uh, uh, with that, uh, members, we are adjourned.